So good morning and thanks. Thanks for coming. And today, as Liz was saying, we're going to talk about the building and destruction by fire of Fort Johnston. And that was in 1775. And uh, the, the building and even the destruction of Fort Johnston, the, the people, the men critical to it were the royal governors at that at that time. And there were, we're going to talk about five royal gov governors. Where there were only five of them in history. Um, and that'll take us from 1730 through 1775. So <clears throat> what we're also going to do is talk a little bit about the local events that tie um, North Carolina into the Revolutionary War. OK. Are there any objections? There you go. <clears throat> So at the time the American uh, independence was declared, uh, 12 of the 13 colonies were, nine of the 13 colonies were royal colonies. And you can see them in, uh, in gold there. And the date, <coughs> The dates behind them in parentheses, and let's just go to Massachusetts. In 1620, Massachusetts was established. So that's the date of establishment for each of the colonies. And then in 1690-91, Massachusetts became a, a royal colony. Um, there were also two proprietary colonies, Pennsylvania and Delaware. They were uh, both operated by the William Penn family. And then uh, the other, the last two are what we call charter colonies. And it really quite interesting because they, re they did operate like independent republics, democratic republics. So the governor was the governor was elected by the people. The legislature was elected by the people, and other and other officials were elected by the by the voters. I shouldn't really say the people, uh, but voters at that point meant free white men who own property. And so you hear, well, all the voters are going to vote. It was probably about three to five percent of the population were, voted. Right? <clears throat> North Carolina became a royal colony in 1720-29 after seven of the eight original Lords proprietors sold their holdings back to the crown, so back to the, to the king. Right. Now, before that, North Carolina was part of the colony of Carolina, and that was established uh, or chartered in 1663. And then in 1712, North Carolina and South Carolina separated and be, you know, became their own, own colonies. So we're talking about starting here about the, the 1729, 1730. And that's, as I mentioned, when North Carolina became a royal colony. Uh, the crown's goal was to really gather greater wealth for England. And to achieve this goal, they believed that the governor and his officials must be servants of the, of the crown. And they must be independent of the colonial assemblies, which again, the colonial assemblies were elected by the, by the voters. The governor is appointed by the king, the crown, uh, the legisl legislature is elected by the, the voters in the colony. However, the crown complicated the whole thing by deciding that, that rather than the crown paying the salaries of the governors and the other officials, the crown required that the colonial assembly was to pay their salaries. Now, just think about how that would work. Right? Let's say the royal governor um, <clears throat> refused to sign the bills that the legislature was, was sending to him. So the governor refuses to sign those bills. And what's the reaction from the legislature? Well, we're not going to pay you. And that's what happened quite, quite, quite often. All right. Um, so it, it really was not. <laughs> um, why am I doing that all the time? 
go blog morning again. Sorry. So then it's again against this background that all royal, all the royal governors uh, across the 13 colonies had to had to operate where the uh, they did not control uh, the purse strings much at all. Uh, so the timeline kind of lays out the five royal royal governors and the uh, the length of their their tenure as royal governor. So it started in 1730 when the king appointed George Burrington a, as North Carolina's first royal governor. And he held that post for four years. Burrington was followed in the position by Gabriel Johnston, of course, of Fort, Fort Johnston fame. Gabriel Johnston served for 18 years as a royal governor. 65-year-old Arthur Dobbs served for 11, 11 years. And um, the fourth royal governor was William Tryon, and he served for six years. And then the last royal governor, although he didn't quite know it at that time, was Josiah Martin, and he served for five years. All of these men were wealthy. All of them were, had uh, wealthy families, influential families. And, and of course, they, uh, <clears throat> they knew other, uh, others of the, of the same class. Um, before going into the history of each each man, I thought it's fun to explore how they are remembered today. So, how is George Burrington remembered today? Burrington Street. Burrington Street. There you go. Burrington Street. So everybody lives on Burrington. It's Ab Avenue. Burrington Ab Avenue, of course, would re know what the name George Burrington. Anything else you remember would be remembered for. Well, historians might remember him as being the first royal royal governor of, of North Carolina. And, and people who read books about um, the expediency of a war with France, if anyone reads those that type of book or that book specifically, they would remember George Burrington because he's the author of that book. And he wrote the book in 1743. When you get home, go on Amazon and uh, search for the expediency of war with France, and you'll see that you can buy a, a paper copy of, of the book for $17.95. Or if you'd rather use a, a Kindle, Kindle edition, you can buy a Kindle copy for $8.75. So I don't know who these people are out there who are maybe maybe bought his, his book, but they, they sure would possibly remember, remember him. So remembered for, for that. Gabriel Johnston is, of course, remembered for Fort Johnston, his, his namesake fort, and it bears his name. Uh, he's, uh, Johnston County is also uh, named in honor of Gabriel Johnston. Uh, in history, the third royal governor, which is Arthur Dobbs, he's known uh, in the scientific world for um, his research on what he called the catch fly. And uh, he recorded the first written description of the plant. And that plant, of course, was later named the Venus flytrap. So that's probably where he is, he is most well, well known. Um, he had a name at the time of the revolution, uh, he, Dobbs County existed. Uh, soon after the revolution, it was divided into Wayne County, Greene County, and uh, Lenore County. Am I saying that close to correctly? Lenore County? Okay, that's good. Um, the, the, William Tryon is known today for a couple things. First, if you had visit, visited Tryon Palace in New Bern, you would, of, of course, remember that it was named after the royal governor, William Tryon. Others would know him because of the role of his character in the popular TV series, Outlander. Mm -hmm. And some will know that there once was a Tryon County. However, the county was renamed later on as Polk County. 
after the former president who was a North Carolina native. Then Josiah Martin, what might Josiah Martin be known for? Well, again, history buffs would probably know that he was the last royal, and you're going to know for a while, <laughs> a day or so, <laughs> I hope, uh, that he was the last royal governor in North Carolina. Others would, uh, you also may know that Martin County was named after, after him, uh, but not for long, because after the American Revolution, the people of the county wanted to change the county's name. But they decided to keep the name and make the name in honor of Alexander Martin, who was a two-term governor of North Carolina in the late 1700s. So they, they got their wish, and they didn't even have to change the letterhead. All right. So let's go on to, um, to meet the royal governors. And the first, first is George Burrington. And again, uh, you see on the slide that there's two sets of dates, 1724 to 1725, and then the 1731 to 1734. 1730, and I'm going to explain why, why, the, why that is. The first set of dates are there because King George I appointed Burrington to be the proprietary governor of North Carolina and Burrington served in that position for two years, 1724 and then 1725. Then there's a, a period where he's not, not governor. Then in 1730, he's appointed royal governor by King George II. Right. So Burrington has the distinction of being twice appointed governor. Unfortunately, he also has the distinction of being twice fired from his post. So both times that he's fired, it's because of his erratic and um, threatening behavior. Burrington regularly made vicious, uh, vicious attacks on his, on his colleagues. He also physically, at, at times, attacked his, one, or, one of his colleagues. Um, but despite his lack of interpersonal skills, Burrington worked hard to develop the Cape Fear region. So to bring more people into the region, he offered land grants to new migrants. He also had new roads built into the colony. And one road went from New Bern to Brunswick Town and another from the Virginia border down to the, to the lower Cape Fear. In addition, he established a settlement on the east bank of the Cape Fear River, a settlement that we now call Wilmington. And to keep the colony and the colonists safe, he ad advocated for construction of a fort to protect Brunswick Town and the new, new settlement. So uh, many people appreciated back, back then, and I think today, that he's worked it worked to improve the colony. However, his erratic behavior continued. And for instance, if, if someone directly opposed him, and it, you know, it may, it may be something simple, I, like I like cream in my tea. Uh, you know, but if someone opposed him, he got angry. You know, he got, he got physically angry. Uh, um, and that happened so, so often. And it also happened to his friends. Someone was a friend, but he had, he had this capacity to make them, to quickly make them an, an enemy. So fortunately for the colony and for himself, he realized that his situation was beyond intolerable. And in early 1734, Burrington requested to be, leave, to be relieved from his responsibilities as governor because of his ill health. One of his contemporaries wrote, quote, if one-tenth of what his enemies said about him was true, it was a wonder that he got away from the colony alive, close quote. 
Later that, Burring, later that year, Burrington was replaced by Gabriel Johnston, and Burrington returned to, to England. His, his life in England, we don't know much about his activities, except we do know that he, that he wrote a, bo a book in 1740-48. Now, sadly, he was murdered during a robbery attempt at St. James. That's St. James Park in London. Uh, at 79 years of age, but ever the fighter, there was evidence that George Burrington struggled mightily with his assailant. The second royal governor following George Burrington was 35-year-old Gabriel Johnston, and he served for 18 years as the, <clears throat> and so he was the longest serving royal governor of North Carolina. He was efficient, he was popular, probably because he followed George Burrington, but like all other royal governors, he had constant difficulties with the provincial assembly over financial matters. For example, when North Carolina became a royal colony, the colonists could no longer, by law, could no longer pay their taxes in kind. They had to pay their taxes in hard money. <clears throat> there was not enough hard money in the colony to pay to pay the taxes com completely. Um, Johnston's salary depended on that those taxes being being collected. <clears throat> they weren't collected. He did not get paid. His salary was a thousand pounds a month. So, so because of the change in the law, the change of the status of the colony from proprietary to uh, to a, a royal colony, you had that tension. Always had that tension between the governor and the leg legislature. Um, And when he died, his salary was in arrears for 14 years. Uh, fortunately for him, he had uh, accumulated 25,000 acres, and um, he, he also had 100 enslaved workers uh, for that acreage. So during his administration, he issued more land grants and tax incentives to the migrants. Being of Scottish birth, Johnston made a point of working with the Scottish Highlanders coming into the colony. And these Highlanders and other migrants boosted the colony's population from less than 30,000 people to over 90, well over 90,000 people. In other matters, uh, he ended a, a boundary dispute did, boundary dispute between North Carolina and South Carolina. He had the laws of the colonies printed, I bet that was handy. And he promoted schools and he worked to improve the state of religion in the colony. And he virtually abandoned Brunswick Town as a port and set up Wilmington in its place. How many of you have heard of King Roger Moore? All right. <laughs> The Moore, the Moore family established, established Brunswick Town and Orton Plantation. They were called the family in the way that you might call members of the mafia part of the family. Right. So Johnson was, was taking on the, the big boys when, uh, say, he essentially abandoned Johnston of uh, Brunswick Town. All right. As you might guess, Johnston also played a leadership role in his in the effort to establish Fort Johnston. And like Burrington, he advocated for a port to protect the colony from attacks. Uh, he appointed a committee to choose the best defensive location for the fort. And in 1748, the Provincial Assembly authorized him to construct the fort that they called Johnston's Fort. 
And fortunately, given the situation with financial matters, the assembly also appropriated 2,000 pounds so that the construction can, could begin. In September of, the, of, of 1748, Spanish privateers attacked the fledgling fort and Brunswick town, making it clear that a proper fort was really, was really necessary. So let's look at the Spanish attack for a moment. It's September 4th, 1748, uh, two Spanish privateering ships, the Fortuna and the uh, Loretta, sailed to Fort Johnston intending to capture the enslaved workers. However, the 4th of September in 1748 was a Sunday, and the workers had been moved from the fort to Brunswick Town, which is, of course, just 12 miles or so upriver. When the privateers reached Brunswick Town, they caught the townspeople completely by surprise when the two ships bombarded the town. When the shelling stopped, a landing party drove the townspeople into the woods and they, they looted the town and merchant ships that were docked nearby. On the third, third day, of Christmas. On the third day, the local Brunswick and Wilmington militias drove the privateers back to their ships, but again, they started to bombard the, the town. And that really did not end until the Fortuna exploded and sank, and then the privateers retreated to, to the sea. <clears throat> so the Spanish attack was 1748. The next year, 1749, uh, Governor Johnston declared that the fort had been completed. <clears throat> Several others at the time emphatically disputed his announcement. And in reality, the completion of the fort was pushed forward uh, to, the, to the next royal governor. And the next royal governor was 65-year-old Arthur Dobbs. Uh, so he's the third North Carolina royal governor. Dobbs, um, I think it was a bit of a renaissance man, if not meeting the whole uh, definition. Uh, he was an engineer, he was a scientist, a scholar, he was a, ge a geographer, and also now he was a public administrator. But when you consider that the average age of death in that time was 37 years, this is a 65-year-old man taking on probably the hardest job of his, his life and holding that position for for 11, 11 years. I'm all for those old folks. <laughs> so French and Indian War started at the, about the same time that Dobbs became governor and uh, Fort Johnston's role. He's, Dobbs sent men from Fort Johnston uh, to um, be part of militia groups from other, other col colonies. Uh, he, as an administrator, he encouraged economic growth and he supported the development of schools, industry, trade, and also the postal service. He also requested and received more funds for Fort Johnston. Um, so he, he wanted the money to be spent properly. So he used his engineering background and um, his interest in the in the fort, and so he spent a lot of time direct planning and directing the work that was being done on on the fort. So that was kind of a, his major uh, contribution. Uh, no other law, royal governor, uh, certainly not Burrington or or even Johnston, had done that much, you know, in their own hands, if you will, got their hands dirty in the in the building of the fort. In 1760, which was a little, about halfway through his, his tenure, um, he had problems with uh, the assembly over a financial matter. The assembly had wanted to pass a bill that allowed would, would allow the assembly to run the North Carolina government using paper money. And after consulting with the Crown, Dobbs refused, refused to sign the bill. So this situation was resolved in late 1760 when the new king, 
King George III uh, reconfirmed Dobbs as governor and extended his authority over the assembly. So now we've all we've we've now referenced all three Georges, George one, two, and three, and it will be on the exam. So, all right. So, despite the the support and the work of Governor Dobbs, the process of constructing Fort Johnston continued to go slowly. And it wasn't until early 1764 when a committee of the provincial colony approved the work on the fort with certain deficiencies. There was a missing doors. One room had a missing floor. You know, so... Now, I, I think this is amazing as, you know, having watched the building of the, of the creeping forward of the building of the, of, the, of the fort. But by October of that same year, by 1764, the Provincial Assembly approved the work on the fort. <clears throat> and Fort Johnston, 16 years after it work began, <clears throat> Fort Johnson was declared completed. Sadly, Governor Dobbs suffered a stroke and he died in 1765, early 1765. <clears throat> During the funeral at Fort, Fort Johnston's guns were fired, quote, to the memory of this great and good man. So Royal Governor Arthur Dobbs is buried in Brunswick Town at St. Philip's Church, which he, he did help to establish. The fourth Royal Governor is the ever popular 35-year-old William Tryon. He was a former military officer and he approved to be an efficient and commanding administrator. So early in his tenure, he became unpopular because he was, he was overzealous in his efforts to enforce the laws. And an example, Tryon did not, he did not favor the Stamp, Stamp Act because he, he believed, again, it would drain the colony of its hard money. However, it was a law and he was going to uphold that law quote, with all of the force of his command. <clears throat> now, regarding Fort Johnston, Tryon as a military man turned out to be a critic rather than the builder of the, a builder of the fort. And uh, he found it, but he did find it convenient to use the men's, the men, their weapons, their supplies, and their experience in, in, on several occasions that he, he needed their help. <clears throat> so, uh, during his tenure, most of his time was spent addressing protests, and the first protest was against the Stamp Act. So as you probably know, the Stamp Act was the first direct tax on the American colonists, and the purpose of the tax was to raise money, again, to pay the debts of the French and Indian War. Stamps were required for newspapers, almanacs, pamphlets, broadsides, legal documents, even dice and playing cards. What was the impact of the Stamp Act? Well, let's just take one example. Stamp Act made marriage more expensive. As the Stamp Act said, and I'll quote, for every piece of paper on which shall be any license, a stamp duty of 10 pounds shall be collected and paid. 10 pounds in that time period is huge, huge. And it's, I don't want to give anybody 10 pounds today either. Um, so on February 20th of 1766, several hundred, how many know the, the story of the Stamp Act at Brunswick Town? Okay. Good. <laughs> um, so on February 20th of 1766, several hundred armed co colonists threatened tax officials in Brunswick Town. And the officials were forced to resign, and they were also forced to sign documents stating that the tamps, 
the stamps, would no longer be required in the Cape Fear region. And, and as you may know, the Brunswick Town protest was one of the first incidents of armed colonial resistance in the British rule. So just that one year after the Stamp Act was enacted, the, the act was repealed. And at the same time, Parliament created the Declaratory Act. And the Declaratory Act essentially stated, or declared, that colonial representation was not necessary as Parliament had the authority to make laws binding on the American colonies, quote, in all cases whatsoever. Together, the Stamp Act and the Declaratory Act became one of the, one of the several common causes that helped unite the 13 colonies in opposition to the activities of Parliament. At about the same time that the Stamp Act was repealed, the regulator movement began in central and western parts of the colony. Now, the, the regulator movement name refers to the desire of colonists to regulate their own affairs. They were protesting unfair taxation, corrupt government officials, and representation. One of the regulator's targets was Tryon's private attorney. And this was a man who had been convicted of extortion of tax money from residents. But when that man was only given a proverbial slap on the wrist, the regulators physically attacked him and burned his house down. This outraged Tryon, and in May of 1771, he led a provincial militia force at the Battle of Alamance. And even though his troops were outnumbered, his trained militia easily defeated the regulators. After the battle, Tryon returned to New Bern, and four days later, he and his family set sail where he would become the last royal governor of New York. So some historians believe that the Battle of Alamance was, first, was the first battle of the revolution because it involved taxes and representation. Others say, no, that's such an over, overstep. Regulators simply wanted to make the colony's political process more equal and fairer. Another issue that Tryon had to deal with was Tryon Palace. When he became governor, the parliament, the, the assembly, amazingly, agreed to provide him with 15,000 pounds to construct a home and administrative office for the royal governor in New, New Bern. And while the palace was a magnificent place, it really didn't take too long for the colonists to figure out, hmm, beautiful place, but uh, who's going to pay for it? Oh, they're going to want us to pay, to pay, pay for it. So uh, in, in one of the several petitions that they, uh, the colonists sent to the governor, one of them bluntly said, quote, we are determined not to pay the tax. We want no such house, nor will we pay for it. And by the way, Fort Johnston also provoked resistance because it was seen as a drain on the treasury that only benefited coastal residents. So that's the, uh, uh, the, the main issues that he had to deal with. I want to note that uh, on the slide uh, that the original palace succumbed to fire in 1798. And the picture on the, flyer, on the slide shows today's Tryon Palace, which was built in the 1850s. And it was built using the original plans from 17, 1770. So it also sits on the on the original loca location of the uh, of Tryon's palace. Okay. It's a good visit when you go to go to New Bern. Okay, the fifth and the last royal governor was 34 year old Josiah Martin, and he. Early 
early in his tenure as governor, he was he was well received and he even visited former regulators and, and he won the trust of many of them because of his interest in their in their problems. However, Martin's time was soon consumed was time was consumed with other issues. And in early 1775, Martin ended the Royal Assembly in North, North Carolina. Martin wrote to the Earl of Dartmouth, who was the Secretary of State of the Colonies. So he was the, he was the man that, that ran the 13 colonies for the crown. <clears throat> but, he, but he wrote that royal authority in the colony was but a shadow of its former self. He concluded that there will not long remain a trace of Britain's dominion over these colonists. His prediction came true on April 19th of 1775 when the battles of Lexington and Concord occurred. The revolution had begun and committees of safety took over to enforce the authority of the provincial assemblies and the Continental Congress. So when the news of the battles of Lexington Concord reached New Bern, which of course there would have been a, a delay, Martin feared that if he and his family stayed in New Bern, they would be held captive. So he, what they did was that his wife and children went to Long Island, New York. They went by sea to Long Island and they stayed in Long Island with uh, his wife's parents. For himself, he fled New Bern to Fort Johnston and he arrives at Fort Johnston in early June of 1775. However, Fort Johnston did not prove to be the safe haven. Did you get that right? Safe haven? Okay. Governor Martin, uh, that Martin had hoped it might be. Six weeks after he arrived, the Wilmington Committee of Safety sanctioned an attack on Fort Johnston. The next day, the threat of that attack reached Governor Martin, and he left Fort Johnston and took refuge on a British man of war, uh, the HMS Cruiser, which just happened to be anchored nearby in the Cape Fear. So... Uh, on July 8, 18th, the Patriots were frustrated when they arrived at the fort to find that Martin had fled to the, eight, to the HMS cruiser and that the fort had been disarmed. Actually, what, the, uh, what they did was they uh, spiked the cannons and they dumped them on the banks of the, of the river so that they would be under the guns and could be under the protection of uh, the HMS cruisers. Cannons. Oh. The next night, Patriots seized and burned down the fort. I, I've heard that this was over the years confusion. Okay, so who burned the fort? Fort the British or the pa Patriots? Well, Patriots burned Fort Johnson because it was a, a a loyalist fort, a royal fort. <clears throat> the next night. They burned down the fort, and Martin later wrote that all built, quote, all buildings in the fort, which being of wood, burnt like tinders and were entirely consumed. After the burning of the fort, the British troops and the Patriots carried on seven months of period of cat and mouse skirmishes. Some of them were focused on the guns that were on the uh, on the river riverbank, other things that happened is the British uh, raided and destroyed the local plantations of local patriot patriot leaders. Two of them being um, jo uh, James Moore and um, William Howe. There's like five Howes in there. <laughs> William Howe, William Howe. And those plantations were very, very close to us at this time. Both of those men had been commanders of Fort Johnston in earlier times. <clears throat> During the revolution, they both became major generals of the Continental Army. Uh, 
Martin took advantage of this time by preparing a plan to retake North Carolina. The crux of the plan called for the creation of a loyalist militia that would join with British troops to create a conquering army. So the stalemate continued until February of 76, when Governor Martin's not so secret plan to regain control of North Carolina was approved. And that was a plan that when executed would lead to the Battle of Moores Creek Bridge. And the Battle of Moores Creek Bridge took place just 18 miles northwest of, of Wilmington. And it is a national park uh, today. So while Martin's plan called for an army of 10,000 loyalists, only 1,600 loyalists marched from uh, met in Fayetteville and then marched from Fayetteville towards Wilmington to join British troops that were coming by sea from both Boston and England. On the morning of February 27th of 76, a thousand patriots were positioned on the far side of the of Moores Creek Bridge to block the loyalists from crossing the bridge. The loyalist force, which included many Scottish Highlanders, attacked the patriots, but they were quickly defeated. Patriot casualties were extremely low. The record says one. Okay. 30 to 40 of the loyalists were killed and hundreds were captured. The Patriots also seized arms, supplies, and they found a cache of 15,000 pounds sterling. And truly, at that time in the build up to the revolution, this was a great victory for the for North Carolina Patriots. Now, this battle is sometimes called the Lexington of the South. And again, that may be an, an overstep, but the battle was very important as this setback largely ended British activities in North Carolina for three years. And just two months after the battle, North Carolina became the first colony to instruct its delegates to the Continental Congress to vote for independence. Now, let's talk about the aftermath of the battle. What was the aftermath for the royal governor and what was the aftermath for Fort Johnston? So after the loyalist loss of Morse Creek Bridge, Martin believed that for at least the time being, his cause was lost. And in May of 76, Martin left the Cape Fear with the British fleet and traveled to Charleston. Stop. When Martin departed North Carolina, the little bit that was left of royal governance departed with him. And in mid-December of 76, the North Carolina Congress, which was established by the Patriots in 1774, adopted a North Carolina Bill of Rights and a North Carolina Constitution. So just a year earlier, North Carolina was a royal colony under British rule. Quote, now independence had been declared, a new government for, formed, and troops were in the field to defend it. For his part, the last royal governor of New York, of North Carolina, returned to England where he, he died at the age of 49 in 1786. But what was the math aftermath for Fort Johnston? <clears throat> Well, the North Carolina Congress passed a bill uh, into law for the uh, reconstruction of Fort Johnston, and that bill was passed in 1778. And, and the, uh, it also included an, additional, an initial appropriation of 5,000 pounds, and that sum was later supplemented to a total of 15,000 pounds. Now, in addition, separate from that 1778 act, in 1810, three decades later, the headquarters and officers quarters building was constructed. And today, this building serves as the home of the city of Southport's museum and visitor center. From its initial construction to 1748 to today, Fort Johnson has nearly 280 years of virtually continuous public service. 
to America. I'd say that Fort Johnson did pretty well. Uh, I want to finish with with this information because I think it, I think it's interesting. <laughs> I thought so. I'd like to share the fate of the last royal governors in the thirteen colonies, and the first first one I want to talk about is Connecticut Governor Jonathan Trumbull. He was an elected governor. And he was the only colonial governor who wholeheartedly supported the re revolution and remained in office. Trumbull has the distinction of serving as the first governor of the state of Connecticut. In Rhode Island, Joseph Lawton, just like Trumbull, was an elected governor. However, he was also a Quaker and he he would, he would not work, for instance, to help raise troops for the Continental Army. So at the request of the Provincial Assembly, Governor Wanton retired to his home and he lived the remainder of his life in Rhode Island. <clears throat> Different story for Thomas Hutchinson of Massachusetts, and because in 1774, he had, re uh, given way to a military government that was led by Brit British Major General Thomas Gage. So former Governor Hutchinson died in 1780 at his London home. Our friend William Tryon was, who had, as we know, was the last royal governor of New York, 1775, he returned to his former life as an army officer and he became the commander of New York's loyalist troops. He died in 1788 at his home in London. <clears throat> in New Jersey, William Franklin, illegitimate son of Benjamin Franklin, was the last royal governor of New Jersey. And he too tried to organize loyalists to fight the Patriots. In May of 76, he was jailed by order of the Continental Congress, and in 1778, he was exchanged for a Patriot prisoner. After the exchange, he went to London, where he died in 1813. In 1777, <clears throat> um, Pennsylvania's governor, John Penn, who was William Penn's grandson, was put under house arrest and the Penn family estates were forfeited to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. He lived with his family in Lansdowne, Pennsylvania until his death in 1795. Lansdowne is just outside of Philadelphia. Patriots gave Governor, uh, Maryland Governor Robert Eden the opportunity to peacefully leave his governorship and he left, he did. He went to uh, England in 1776. He returned in 1783 because he wanted to retire. That was after the war, he wanted to retire to Maryland, which he did, but unfortunately he, he died a, um, a short time later. Now, New Hampshire governor, my favorite story, New Hampshire governor John Wentworth fled his post in 1775 when he was met one morning with a cannon aimed at his front door. <laughs> The governor fled to Canada and then to England in 1778. And a few, but a few years later, he returned to Canada where he lived to, the, to be 84 years old and he was the last surviving royal governor. Okay, now let's do three of them, like, or four, like Governor Josiah Martin. Royal governors, Lord William Campbell of South Carolina, Sir James Wright of Georgia, and the Earl of Dunmore, John Murray of Virginia, were all forced early in the war to return to England for their own safety. So that's the fate of the royal governors. And so by the end of 1776, all governors except for Connecticut Governor Trumbull had left their position and governing authority completely collapsed. A collapse some colonies started as early as 1774 when the Patriots took control of the militias, the law courts, the printing presses, and the assemblies. And I'll end with this. As John Adams later said, the revolution was affected before the war commenced. <laughs> well, thanks for joining me this morning. <laughs> I hope you found it uh, interesting, and I hope, mostly hope you, your time was well spent. Mm -hmm. <laughs>